Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Happy Friday to you all. Uh, we are welcoming uh, 40 different states and four different countries and over 500 people to our webinar today. And so we're just so thrilled to be here with you. Um, we're broadcasting from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, we're so excited that you're joining us to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, that was then, and this is now. So I am Janice Petrini. I'm the owner and operator of Express Employment Professionals uh, here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I also am welcoming our resident expert on diversity, equity, inclusion, Scott Welch. So welcome. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, here at Express, um, we're always in the workforce and the workplace every day. We're listening to the pain of our clients. We're listening to what their challenges are. And we're listening to what keeps them up at night. And so we're really excited to be able to bring this topic, um, diversity, equity, inclusion. It will become a series. We have a resident expert. And so uh, we're really excited about today's conversation. About Express, in case um, you're not familiar, Express Employment Professionals is a international company. Uh, there's over 840 individual business owners across North America and uh, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand. And on a day-to-day -day basis, we're helping companies find talent, helping talent find great companies to work for. We're the bridge between those two. And then we also have offer training and development for leaders. Um, we love to develop leaders, coach leaders. Uh, we also have a, a lot of work in strategic HR as well. So um, just really happy to deliver these services and also really happy to be able to bring solutions to companies um, to help them to be healthier, more sustainable, and just um, keep continuing to grow, especially with where we are today with the talent shortages and just what we've come through in the last two years with COVID. Uh, companies are looking for best practices to be destination employers and to be an employer of choice. And so we're always happy to bring value in those areas. A bit of housekeeping today, just before we get started, is uh, we want to make sure that you know that we really, really appreciate any questions or comments. So we uh, actually have our event and training coordinator, Anna Nichols, monitoring the question and answer box as well as the chat. So Anna, do you want to say hi to everybody? Thank you, Janice. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Wonderful. Thank you, Anna. So we really want to bring value to you in the conversation today, so please don't hesitate to chime in. Um, we want to know where you're at in this journey. We want to know what questions you have. We want to be able to bring them out into the open. I'll be bringing some questions as well, just on I know what um, we see as the pulse of, of some of the uh, clients that we serve. And of course, um, this will be recorded, so you'll be able to share it with anyone that you think um, would be interested in listening as well within your organization. So. Without further ado, uh, we want uh, we have a lot to cover. So I really want to introduce our, our uh, expert to you. Scott works closely with us at Express Employment Professionals, and uh, he works um, with clients in all areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Scott's the principal founder of Global Bridge Builders, and it's a firm that focuses on organizational development, cultural transformation, and inclusion. And Global Build Bridge Builders is an international company. And so they have a team that's around the world providing services to enterprises across the globe. Global Bridge Builders bases its work in the core belief that inclusion is a business discipline mm -hmm. and that it should be leveraged across all that the enterprise does. To gain this leverage, the firm applies a continuous improvement model and anchored in metrics. Imagine that. Uh, currently, Global Bridge Builders serves a wide range of clients in the U.S. and in seven other countries. Scott has worked in international business and diversity inclusion management for over 20 years and has developed an in-depth knowledge of diversity, inclusion, and workforce development that brings together and maximizes the perfect blend of people and process. Today, we are going to be just keeping things really conversational as well as we'll really have some learning moments for you as well. But Scott, it's just an honor to be sitting next to you today for this very important and needed discussion about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So maybe just to get started, 
uh, just tell our audience a little bit about you, uh, just how you built your company sure. and also how you've developed your passion for being a global bridge builder. Well, thank you, Janice. And first of all, thank you to you and the team here. It's been delightful to work with everybody. And so just so glad to be able to do this together. So thank you again. Me too. Um, and so, yeah, so Global Bridge Builders was started in 2006. And it really was the focus. I was prior to that. I was involved in, in diversity for some time. And then I got recruited by a magazine in New Jersey, where we that's where I did a lot of my work at the Fortune 500. And then I came back because as I looked across the landscape of these large global brands, I found that a lot of these organizations still had massive programs, but they didn't have process. Mm. And so I came back and then I said, you know, what could I do to add value to the marketplace, having seen that? And that's where Global Bridge Builders came about. And so it really is focused, as you said, imagine that on metrics, right? <laughs> and so because it, that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. And I think also it started back in just childhood. I spent, I lived two years in, in a little village in Asia, in Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the only American kid in the entire village. And I always tell folks, not the only African-American kid, but the only American kid in the entire city. And my parents gave me the gift of not living on the military base. We lived in the village with everybody else. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And it just continued to kind of give me a hunger. And I think a passion, as you said, a passion and hunger just for people. Mm -hmm. I love human beings. I just mm -hmm. think it's, um, and you begin to put us in organizations and teams and groups. It just gets really exciting. And when you bring together the fact that we're different mm -hmm. and we can celebrate the heterogeneity of being different, mm -hmm. There's, there's some amazing things that we can produce and, and it just makes life more interesting. Mm -hmm. So, Wonderful. yeah. Thank you for sharing. Uh, maybe just to get started, you know, there's so many different programs and noise and talk about even just these terms, yes. diversity, yes. equity, inclusion, and cultural competence. And so yes. I think you could probably watch 40 different YouTube videos and you could get 40 different interpretations and definitions. True. So just from your perspective, you know, Absolutely. how would you define those terms? You know, thank you. I, I like kind of giving in a way that it's very succinct. We know that those terms are massive. Mm -hmm. Those are rooms yes. in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. But so for instance, so diversity, I just say, you know, diversity is simply an adjective. Mm -hmm. It just describes, right? It just describes who's in the room, mm -hmm. right? But it doesn't tell us how they're included in the room mm -hmm. to include. Mm -hmm. Hence, inclusion mm -hmm. is what I call the action. Mm -hmm. So diversity is the adjective, inclusion, or to include is the action, cultural competency, it's the asset, mm -hmm. right? And so when, when a leader is mm -hmm. culturally competent, she knows that what actually, it, that, that the folks on her team are different, mm -hmm. what motivates them, what inspires them mm -hmm. to go to that next level of innovation and in engagement it's different. So that culturally, when we talk about cultural competency, it literally is an asset because it's a leadership mm -hmm. skill set mm -hmm. to know who your people are. Yeah. And, and I still tell folks, I said, some of your team, they want to be put the spotlight on them and mm -hmm. drop balloons of confetti. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Others want you to come by their office and say, you know what? Great job. Mm -hmm. Know the difference. Yes. yes. Right. And then finally, the last is, is actually um, equity, mm -hmm. and I call that access. Mm -hmm. So diversity, the adjective to include or inclusion is the action. Mm -hmm. Cultural competency yeah. is the asset. Equity is the access. In other words, equity is all about having people come in a room mm -hmm. and not based upon their title, mm -hmm. but to give their voice and their presence and their ideas weight mm -hmm. just by virtue of being Mm -hmm. human and being at the table, right? So I tell people it's interesting because maybe we've been in these rooms where you hear someone mm -hmm. that says something yeah, and all of a sudden it just kind of evaporates. Mm -hmm. And it's probably because for one reason, this person is this and this person is that. So it just disappears. All of a sudden, on the other side of the room at the end of the table, mm -hmm. someone says the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. They're like, that is a brilliant idea. <laughs> So that's where equity yeah. plays a part, because if the room was actually equitable, mm -hmm. that person, no matter their title or background, mm -hmm. would have been heard the first time. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, yeah. and the opportunity with that, Janice, is if we have an equitable room, mm -hmm. you actually have greater access to ideas mm -hmm. because your people have voice whoever they are. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of the big four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, just in the last um, two years, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, companies have gone through so much. Yes. Um, we've had 
civil run unrest, we've had COVID, we've had a, a talent crisis, yes. we've had safe, keeping people safe, we've had well-being issues. Mm -hmm. um, we've, I mean, everybody's at this incredible level of stress yeah. and uh, it just keeps raging. And it's not that companies um, don't want to be, they, they need to be an employer of choice more yes. than ever before yes. to attract talent and retain talent. Mm -hmm. And they want this to be a strategy, Yes. but it just seems so overwhelming. Yes. So what would you say to um, companies that are just like, yes, it's part of what we want to do, <laughs> but we don't even know what to do. Yeah. You know, I, at first, one of the first things is take a deep breath. <laughs> because yeah. here's the thing. The, the other part of this mm -hmm. is that this is not a sprint. Yes. This is a marathon. Mm -hmm. This is a way of doing business. Yes. Right. And no more when people get flustered about their financial systems or HRIS mm -hmm. systems. It just takes time to mm -hmm. do it well. Yeah. We all know we've been kind of in that same fishbowl for some mm -hmm. time now, yeah. to your point. Um, and so we know what's going on, mm -hmm. right? We know there's a lot of different things, a lot of different dynamics. For, we're kind of managing workforces on a daily basis mm -hmm. now. But I would say that. The process is is so large. Mm -hmm. Take it a phase and a bit at mm -hmm. a time, but commit to process, yeah. not to program. Mm -hmm. And as we discussed before, a lot of organizations, they're stuck and they're frustrated because they get into what I call event-centered DEI initiatives, mm -hmm. program-centered DEI yeah. initiatives. Mm -hmm. Comes with a great diversity champion. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't always wear a cape, right? <laughs> but 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 yeah. but and, but they have you know mm -hmm. some of our clients before we kind of engage with them. They mm -hmm. say, "Well, Scott, we've done thirty-seven things this year." I'm like, mm -hmm. "Have you measured anything?" Mm -hmm. Well, not really, and that's because they're tied into the social imperative. So what I would tell leaders, um, and by the way, when I talk leaders, I mean people with influence, which mm -hmm. is everybody, right? Yes. I know there's a legitimate hierarchy yeah. in organizations, but what we're talking about is that. Take it a phase at a time, mm -hmm. commit to it. There are mm -hmm. three best practices that I see across every one of the DNI initiatives, even, even before we begin to work with them, and even the larger scale ones I've mm -hmm. worked with and have continued to work with. They're transparent. Yeah. In other words, they, they're okay with making mistakes. Yeah. Right. And if they make mistakes, it just fell forward. Mm -hmm. The second thing, they're relentless. Mm -hmm. So they're they're like, you know, this is something that is important and it's going to improve our business. And we'll mm -hmm. talk a bit about that later. Yeah. And then finally, they are intentional. Mm -hmm. You mean to lean into DE&I. Mm -hmm. And if you have those three things, mm -hmm. I really find that it really supersedes anything, anything that's cute. Mm -hmm. Because when you get it into the business, when you think about it in terms of a business strategy, yeah. a strategy for sustainability, mm -hmm. a strategy for innovation, mm -hmm. now you're on to something. Yeah. And that's where you begin to see really the outcome, mm -hmm. the, the fruit of, of mm -hmm. really diving into DEI as a business discipline, not as a cute social yeah. program. Yeah. yeah. And don't worry, um, we're going to hear from Scott about uh, just some of the ways that he approaches that. Um, when you, you, you think about um, where companies are at, mm -hmm. and you might be a small business, and yes. you're like, um, yes. I mean, I know all this is great for Coca-Cola <laughs> and IBM and Starbucks, yeah. but I mean, I have a company of 25 people. Um, what, where can I start? Yes, great question. You know, I, I still think, Janice, any organization, regardless of size, can start with principles. Mm -hmm. And I go back to those three, mm -hmm. intentional, relentless, transparent. Yeah. And also, because of the work that I've done in South Africa, I really have just really loved this ideology I discovered my mm -hmm. first time there. And that was something called Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Ubuntu says, I am because you are. Mm -hmm. And in order for me to be human, I can only be human through other human beings. Yeah, I actually think that an organization, regardless of size, mm -hmm. if they have those four characteristics with the addition mm -hmm. of Ubuntu, they really can move forward because yeah. you're valuing the people in the organization. Mm -hmm. They aren't assets. And I tell yeah. people, I've never met a human resource, <laughs> right? I've only met moms and dads, mm -hmm. brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. sons and daughters, mm -hmm. right? And I get the, you know, I get, we have to have titles for things. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if you treat people like people, and actually give them voice mm -hmm. within the organization. Some of the best ideas, mm -hmm. I mean, it's because of the people that are working in the trenches, interfacing with your customer, delivering your product, whatever that might be. If you can actually understand that every single customer interaction 
goes two ways. Mm -hmm. It's either a transaction or it's an opportunity for transformation. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you understand that the latter is more important than the former, yeah, it doesn't matter the size of your firm. Yeah. You can still make a difference and mm -hmm. not just develop clients, mm -hmm. but have fans. Mm -hmm. That's what we want. Yeah. It's, it's proven that um, top performing companies that are diverse have greater innovation. Yes. And vice versa, right? It's true. Great innovation comes with a very diverse company. Yes. So why do you think we're missing the boat? You know, I, I think that we've, a lot of folks, Janice, have actually, they're afraid of being uncomfortable, mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Second, they're afraid of making a, a mistake. Mm -hmm. And I tell yeah. folks, that's a gift we all have. <laughs> yeah. So yes. let's get over it. We're yes. going to make mistakes yeah. because we're human, right? Mm -hmm. And so, because to your point, there are so many great studies. There's Towers Perrin University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. There is uh, the Wharton School. Mm -hmm. There's Ford uh, uh, Motor Automakers out of Germany. Mm -hmm. The same thing. Heterogeneous groups properly managed lead to an innovative mm -hmm. outcome because they have more access. They're different. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, it really makes sense. Yeah. Our ecology even speaks to it because mm -hmm. if the bug ceases to exist, to exist if you've got plants, mm -hmm. you don't have bees that pollinate. Yeah. That's that's biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And if one member is not there, guess what? Yeah. The entire ecosystem suffers. Yeah. We want diversity in our investment portfolios mm -hmm. to optimize return, to minimize, minimize risk. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we do that in our relationships, mm -hmm. working relationships, community relationships, our neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. We actually get better together. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And so that's where heterogeneity and diversity, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And I tell folks that you know, people may have baggage around mm -hmm. diversity. Mm -hmm. No harm, no foul. That's mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. I've never met anyone that's had a problem with innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you want innovation, and to your point, yeah, innovation and diversity, they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And really innovation, as we move forward in this, I mean, we're in the middle of a, mm -hmm. say a global marketplace, but that's the competitive advantage it is. for companies. It just is. Yeah. So I remember, I mean, for mm -hmm. all the talks I've ever given, I remember saying, and I heard myself say it, I was like, that's not exactly right. I used to say, people are an organization's greatest asset. Mm -hmm. And one day I said it, and I was in the middle of a keynote, <laughs> and I said, I got to kind of have a talk with myself mm -hmm. after this, because I don't agree with that, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, this is what... No, actually, engaged people mm. are an organization's mm. greatest asset. Yeah. Disengaged people are an organization's greatest liability. Yeah. Right? Yes. And so it's not enough to just be present, mm -hmm. but you got to be present. Yeah. You have to show up. Mm -hmm. Right. And so otherwise, and one of the Gallup polls show that 18%, at least of the U.S. workforce, were actively disengaged. Mm -hmm. That's 18% saying, I'm, I don't agree with my organization's mission. Mm -hmm. I'm there to collect the check only. Yeah. And I really don't give a rip mm -hmm. about our mission, vision, and values. Yeah. Just pay me. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the necessity of people showing up mm -hmm. and being there, guess what? If they feel like their voice is heard, yeah. if they feel like they're a part of the team, that mm -hmm. their, their opinions don't just evaporate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and one of the things too, is that is where a hierarchy can sometimes get in the way. Yeah. Because the best ideas don't always come from the top. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they come from the people serving the customer. Yes. Right. The people, the guy that drives the backhoe, that's digging the ditches. Right. Mm -hmm. I will trust his, his opinion about mm -hmm. what to buy versus Caterpillar versus John Deere mm -hmm. over the engineer mm -hmm. that actually is designing the street. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah. Because he actually runs the machine. Yeah. That's the beauty of hierarchical diversity. Yes. The point is when I talk about diversity, it's so many different dimensions that I tell folks there are seven and a half billion different interpretations of diversity. Yeah. It's just human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, mm -hmm. opportunity. Yeah. Wonderful. So you lead a diversity and inclusion company, <laughs> yes. but your approach with your organization is yes. to focus on transforming systems and structures yes. with people at the center. Yes. So tell us how you support the right team mindset and behaviors with the right structure and processes to make change happen. So maybe this might be a great time for you to I can share your slides. Well, why not? So I'll, I'll be glad to show folks how to do that. So 
So first of all, you kind of get a sense of what our organization does. Of course, it's, you know, assessment, measurement and systems and everything. And we talked enough about that. But let me get into what you said here. Some of our some of our organizations we love working with. But here's the 30,000 foot view. Now, notice that it actually has five steps and that fifth step actually circles back around to the first step. Mm -hmm. So from a 30,000 foot view, uh, Janice, we, we conduct the assessment. We can talk more about the inclusion systems assessment. Mm -hmm. It is metric driven. Uh, it splits up the work into five categories, right? Leadership, communication, organizational processes, external relationships and process improvement. All terms you probably don't use or organizations don't use with DE&I, yeah. right? Yeah. Because these are innovation and yeah. systems engineering terms. Mm -hmm. But we want it to be accessible. So then once we have the assessment deployed, we then go into uh, the diversity championing teams. We've never showed up in an organization that is doing nothing. Mm -hmm. They're doing mm -hmm. something. Yeah. And sometimes they just need to, uh, it's a recalibration. It's a refreshing, right? Yeah. To really put them within a systems framework. Mm -hmm. So then we've got the plan. Uh, the, the ISA actually produces a metric-based plan as an output. That's how it was programmed and mm -hmm. written. There are about 65,000 respondents right now in the database. So we got mm -hmm. some amazing nice. benchmark opportunities. Yeah. So then the second place, of course, is developing the processes, integrating it with your plan for excellence or your strategic plan, right? Because they go hand in hand. And then we talk about implementing it throughout the organization. So in other words, there's no place in the organization that your systems approach to DEI should not affect and touch, mm -hmm. right? It's not some obscure little corner, right, in the organization. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. Yeah. And then, of course, training employees. But notice that on the process that the employees are actually second or third in the process. Yeah. A lot of organizations lead with training, mm -hmm. but that's kind of like going to the doctor and, and they start poking, poking, and prodding, and they'd say, well, oh, yeah, well, now why are you here? Mm -hmm. yes. You have to find out what is going on mm -hmm. first. So that's where assessment comes into play. Then... As you look at, you talk about organizational performance. So notice that we're going into kind of the innermost workings of the house now, the organization supply chain. Mm -hmm. And then outwardly, how are we communicating this to our community? Mm -hmm. Do they see us as we see ourselves? Is that consistent? How can we better be a better corporate citizen, a better organizational citizen mm -hmm. within the community in which we reside, right? Mm -hmm. Then finally, it leads up to being a culture of service excellence. I mean, when organization, when people want to attach their personal brand to your brand, mm -hmm. now you got something, yeah. right? Yeah. And so that's where we talk about being a, really an employer of excellence, mm -hmm. right? I mean, best and brightest. I mean, this location, your organization, mm -hmm. people like working here. There's a reason for that, and, and it's intentional, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So that's not by accident. And so what happens from that, and we talk about the, the expansion, and that is the market expansion mm -hmm. at the very kind of bottom of that fourth uh, box mm -hmm. there, it's a natural outcome of putting innovation and your people at the center. Mm -hmm. You will discover new opportunities mm -hmm. to serve more clients, more customers. Products might even pop out to serve different communities. Mm -hmm. Because why? Because this process is in place. And then notice at the fifth step, you evaluate the progress and you go back to step one again mm -hmm. because it's a cycle. Mm -hmm. Then, so the way that this works, so now if that map was 30,000, Yes. This is your this is kind of your street level. Okay. Right. Yep. So within that process map, we showed you these are the five steps. We actually go into global bridge. We, we have our tool. So we deploy the, the ISM. Yeah. Right. That gives us what I call our quantitative organizational read. Mm -hmm. It's important to have that data set. Yeah. Then from there, we and that's a, that's an online survey. It's translated into over 100 languages. So we literally we want we love an organization mm -hmm. that are multinational or even location-based, even within the same state. They want to compare notes. We love when that happens. Mm -hmm. So notice that's our that's our organizational um, quantitative. Okay. The second step are what we call dialogue circles. Mm -hmm. And that's focus groups, but that's your qualitative individual. Mm -hmm. That happens there. We want to find out the story, the narrative, of how you do business. What's important to your teams? What's happening that maybe shouldn't be happening, right? Mm -hmm. Then from there, we actually create a customized training process now, notice that training is the third step. Mm -hmm. It's because yes. we have a qualitative and a quantitative data set through which to look at what is most valuable for your organization. Yeah. Right. 
And so then, we, and by the way, that's 100 level, 200 level, 300 level, and 400 level. Mm -hmm. One of the things we do at our 400 level is we train employees within the organization mm -hmm. to be trainers around DEI mm -hmm. because that's the gift that keeps giving. Yeah. And then finally, we, we formulate what we call the Diversity Action Council. That's a heterogeneous slice from top to bottom of the organization. Mm -hmm. Their job is to actually take the assessment mm -hmm. and all those metrics and we have five teams, mm -hmm. leadership, communication, right? The five yes. that we talk about, yeah. those teams from within the organization become your subcommittees to drive innovation and change based upon the results of the ISA mm -hmm. and the focus group information. Mm -hmm. Then in 18 to 24 months time, guess what? We redeploy it again. We have a gap analysis. We know the work that we know where we started. Yeah. We know where the DAC or the action council has taken us mm -hmm. and we know where we are now. And we continue to re re repeat that process. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the five steps in a nutshell and getting from mm -hmm. point A to point B. Because as you said, it's not about, a, it's it's not really a lack of desire to yes. do it. People just don't yeah. know how to do it. Yes. And that's where we really mm -hmm. like making that mm -hmm. opportunity for them in a way that is not consulting speak. Mm -hmm. Because it's all about the people in the organization, making it a better place for them to work and mm -hmm. loving the fact when they come to the organization they, but happy employees make better citizens, better yes. parents, better everything, yes, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. So to tell us about maybe an example um, of maybe a, not that you have to divulge yeah. any names, yeah, sure. but like a company that you went into. And so we deployed the assessment and this is sort of what it looked like. And oh. this is the steps. And this is some of the outcomes yes. that was really realized yes. in this process. So this is interesting because it was where we first saw the efficacy of our process. I mm -hmm. mean, we had the opportunity with a municipality. They have some 15,000 mm -hmm. employees. And when we actually first got the call, essentially, mm -hmm. we walked in, the, the people that met us, Janice, or mm -hmm. the organization was not the employees and it was not the, not the city. It was the Department of Justice. Ooh, right. Okay. So I say that because it's not that it's not that that that's very rare, by mm -hmm. the way. Yeah. But just to kind of show you where we were. Mm -hmm. So we actually ended up de deploying that same process they yeah. saw on the screen over 42 different individual departments. Oh, wow. The city manager. Mm -hmm. So. Going from Department of Justice, mm -hmm. we know that the state that that particular department was in mm -hmm. to, for them to show up, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So fast forward, um, the, the process within that organization, that, that department began to work so well, the city manager took note. Mm -hmm. She then made a mandate for every department, uh, mm -hmm. civilian department, mm -hmm. non-uniform department in that city to go through the process mm -hmm. because she saw that it worked. Then they had a consulting uh, organization come in that was really around, uh, they were kind of gauging some type of climate. And they said, so what are these things called EACs? At the time, it was Employee Advisory Councils, mm -hmm. right? We yes. call them Diversity Action Councils. And the name, right? It, mm -hmm. It's either or. But they found out, unbeknownst to us, they said, so every place that we've gone into inside of the city, when they had this EAC thing, mm -hmm. The people are happier and they're engaged mm -hmm. at a higher level. And guess mm -hmm. what? They don't even call in sick as much. Oh, wow. They literally mm -hmm. have, they call in less sick days. Mm -hmm. He said, so what are these things? Mm -hmm. And it actually got back to me, mm -hmm. secondary. Mm -hmm. I said, really? That's pretty cool. They said, yeah, every place there was an EAC, less mm -hmm. sick days, more engagement. The morale of the department was just much higher. Mm -hmm. So fast forward from that. Eight years later, because it takes time, yeah. that same city, that same department that had a DOJ mm -hmm. actually won a national award for their DEI oh, practices. Wow. Wow. So, and that's wow. just one. In fact, mm -hmm. that that uh, example is on our website. It's mm -hmm. on Global Bridge Builders, and it talks about it. But mm -hmm. it really was so wonderful to see that. And when you have when you roll the process out 42 times, mm -hmm. you really begin to see what's what. Yeah. And uh, but that's one of our success stories. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So when you, when the uh, assessment is deployed, yeah, I mean, typically, where do you see the brokenness in the <sighs> beginning? You know what? I think where people would least uh, expect it, we see it. Of course, you kind of understand it. You would see it at, in the systems criteria, that mm -hmm. fifth discipline, because that's the auditing function yeah. where you kind of just continue mm -hmm. to march the process down the road. But the probably the biggest Achilles tendon or mm -hmm. Achilles, yeah, the Achilles tendon is actually communication. Mm -hmm. Show me an organization 
Mm -hmm. that communicates better and I'll show you a stronger organization. Mm -hmm. Show me one where it's dysfunctional, where the messaging changes from level to level and layer to layer. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you an organization that is at war with itself. Mm -hmm. Communication Mm -hmm. really to me is where organizations win or lose. Mm -hmm. Because you think about it, a lot of organizations, people spend so much of their time in politics. Mm -hmm. They forget that they have a customer Mm -hmm. or they forget their mission yeah and once they can actually say our focus is to put the customer in the center and by the way the employees are also customers mm-hmm. if you can really hold that sacred mm-hmm. you just there's a stronger organization mm-hmm. so we that's what we really find is it's the systems criteria part and it's communication mm-hmm. and one of the we all, one of the things we also find out janice is there's a place on the assessment that says gives the opportunity to answer i don't know mm-hmm You'd be surprised how many best practices exist within organizations that the employees know nothing about. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things. And we tell people, if they don't know, you have two options. You either need to, you need to communicate it. Mm -hmm. And then the assessment, because of the responses, you need to create it because it's a best practice. But a lot of employees and a lot of organizations, Mm -hmm. they just say, it's just the way we do business. But I'm like, it's important for your people to know. Yeah. So... In those d- diversity action council meetings, yes. so what's really taking place in mm. those um, meetings? Uh, so what happens is they get the ISA. Mm-hmm. Their 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 playbook is the, is that document. Mm-hmm. They live there, yes. right? So in the DAC meetings, what they do is they take the assessment each a subcommittee, and they've got their they've mm-hmm. got their um their path charted mm-hmm. within the response of the assessment. Yeah, we then tie a. A uh, time constraint to every one of the areas. So let's say, let's say I'm a part of the communications subcommittee. Mm-hmm. I have a whole list of things from the ISA. Those are my marching orders. Mm-hmm. I have to then choose what I call S1s, S2s, and S3s. S1s are those what we call suddenly. Those mm-hmm. are things we can actually tackle within zero to 30 days. S2s are strategics, mm-hmm. 31 to 120 days. Okay. S3s mm-hmm. are those things that we can get after 121 plus days. Mm-hmm. So not only do you have the items in the ISA, you also have a time constraint. Mm-hmm. And their job is to get at it. Mm-hmm. And their job is to move at those things along. Mm-hmm. A lot of what they do, Janice, when the when the first DAC, when their first DAC meeting, for instance, mm-hmm. I tell them, your first four months is going to be fact-finding. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're calling people in the organization or talking and say, hey, how much do we purchase from this particular community? Or do we have a zero tolerance policy? Or what is our turnover rate, right? Mm-hmm. So that's the work of the deck. And they meet monthly, generally mm-hmm. one and a half to two hours of clients. And then they have subcommittee meetings. So they meet one, one and a half to two hours as a DAC, mm-hmm. but the subcommittees also have meetings mm-hmm. because the goal of the broader DAC meeting is to report the work that you've done in your subcommittee mm-hmm. and not to actually do the work mm-hmm. at the DAC meeting. Mm-hmm. But it's so beautiful because it really engages the employees. Yes. yes. And they they see that. And the ISA, those are not, there's no fluff in the ISA. Mm-hmm. These are all business mm-hmm. statements that you agree with and systems rather that people have responded to. And so the beauty of it is when you actually pay attention to the ISA as a subcommittee, mm-hmm. you're actually positively affecting the business as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And for companies that may not have a system or a structure or right. they need help with that type yes. of thing, um, do you do you help set help them set those up? Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. And that's part of that's part of kind of how we come alongside mm-hmm. of our partner organizations. Yeah. Because there's a coach there every mm-hmm. single month. So yes. they don't just have the meeting. Mm-hmm. There's a global bridge builders provider. They're coaching them through it until they get that cadence. Yes. And they get moving. Mm-hmm. And those subcommittees are strong, mm-hmm. right? We literally have, we actually have some courses where we teach organizations how to have a productive meeting. Mm-hmm. So we literally help them because some of them are struggling with that. Yes. Before we can get to some of the other things, let's make sure that you're actually being able mm-hmm. to make decisions as a group. Yeah. So we literally customize that approach, but we walk with our with our mm-hmm. clients step by step. Yeah. Because we want them to win. And one of the goals we have for every one of our clients, Janice, we want them to be what we call a teaching organization. Mm-hmm. And so let's say that you as an organization, let's say a, an organization that manufactures particular type of widget. Mm-hmm. And you're known for doing that, and you've got 75% market share, but you have a real desire to go into the process orientation around DEI. Mm-hmm. You know what? If you have a great DEI system, mm-hmm. you have organizations that are outside of your widget 
industry. They just want to see how you did that well. Mm -hmm. And you can teach them mm -hmm. whether they be in your industry or outside, you become a teaching organization. And we love when our clients are able to mm -hmm. teach. Of course, they do their job well, their, their industry mm -hmm. well, but we love when they can teach DE and I as well. Yeah. So some I, I heard a term uh, on a, a, a talk on DE and I where someone said, sometimes it feels like you're trying to boil the ocean <laughs> and you can't boil the ocean. And so yes. I, 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 uh, how do you address, uh, you know what? It's, it, and with this process, yes, it sounds yes. like we're taking, we're, ta we're very specifically taking and, and moving things forward um, one thing at a time. Oh, yeah. The process is a long process. Yes. It doesn't change overnight. Yes, it's so true. I mean, and I tell people, you're going to give me talks, I'll say, what I'm going to tell you, like, it's like a, taking a cup mm -hmm. and putting it into Lake Michigan. Mm -hmm. Right. It yeah. does have value, but there's so much more. Yes. Right. And so when, when they say it's trying to boil the ocean, mm -hmm. I get I get the analogy. Mm -hmm. But as you said, I mean, we're very methodical. Yes. Now, here's the difference. We have organizations before they became clients, we would say our process is one of the most rigorous in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. We don't apologize for that. And we're mm -hmm. talking about process and the business of here. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Let's just get going. Please hurry up. Right. <laughs> and I say, Do you really listen to what I'm saying. This is very process driven. Yeah. So once then we begin to get into the metrics and the assessment and setting all these different processes up, I'm like you really meant what you said. I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. because in order to have success in this, you have to treat it like the major functions in your organization. Yes. We don't give DEI and I a pass in our process. Mm -hmm. We actually put it as a part of your innovation portfolio, your business strat plans. Mm -hmm. That's where it, it should live in the organization. Because mm -hmm. if it lives on the side in some obscure little corner in the mm -hmm. organization, yeah. it will never, you'll never realize the ultimate potential mm -hmm. of the fact that this literally is an innovation strategy yeah. for your organization. Mm -hmm. We know the world's changing. Mm -hmm. Bill Gates wrote the book, Business at the Speed of Thought, right? Mm -hmm. It is, yes. you know, and so what, uh, what is occurring here is, and the labor shortage, all these different things. So what does that mean? That means we need different brains around the table. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes the brains that we have around the table, yes, yeah, sure, keep them there. But the question shouldn't be who's at the table. The mm -hmm. question now should be who's not at the table. Mm -hmm. It yeah. might be a person in the mailroom mm -hmm. that may have a perspective. I tell folks, Innovation always happens on the fringes. Mm -hmm. So you never want to be safe and say, I'm going to go to my industry's conference mm -hmm. and think you're going to get breakthrough ideas there because you've all essentially been trained in the same way of thinking. Yeah. I love having different industries come together to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. So you get, and so within an organization, you get someone from up here in the organization, a new person in the organization, mm -hmm. get someone that's mid level, that's this generation. Mm -hmm. Again, all that's diversity. Yes, yes. And when you put innovation at the center, mm -hmm. you're just trying to get the best solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. And that's where that's just a way of life that organizations commit to. And if they take a deep breath, mm -hmm. yeah. they can do well. I just maybe want to stop for a minute yeah. and see, Anna, if there's any questions that have come up, because I know we've talked about a lot of things. Is there anything that's come up that you think would be important um, to bring to the table at this point? Yes, Janice. Um, actually, I do have a question from Shelly um, and she's wondering that during an interview, how would you answer the question as to how you'd address a coworker who is not participating in DE&I? So uh, how would you, in a, in, a, in a job interview? Let's suppose, uh, she just wrote interview. So let's suppose on a, job interview yes or you know and you're trying to test whether or not they are kind of they have that mindset yes you know if that's the question and hopefully i'm understanding it correctly you know there's so many ways to kind of gauge how people think right and i it's so funny back in the early days of early technology i used to always ask people what's on your ipod <laughs> right what's, what's on your ipod it tells me how they think what are you reading? What's the last thing you read? What magazine do you subscribe to? You know, the whole idea. And then I also think, Anna, one of the things is to, if they're not bringing it up, 
the person doing the interviewing should actually say, this is, this is who we are. Mm -hmm. d and is very important to our organization. And so uh, how do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. And that's a very safe, yeah. um, and from an HR perspective, it's legally compliant. Just say, this is really important for us. And as part of your uh, coming into the organization, uh, we have an or our orientation is we're going to spend probably two or three hours just on DEI. Mm -hmm. So it lets them know if this is the right organization for them. And if they if they bristle at that, they're probably going to have a hard time in the organization because if this is how the organization is living, you know, that is that's a climate that they're going to have to exist within and be expected to con contribute mm -hmm. from within as well. So great. Just answer. as a follow up. His follow up on that too is you know companies have two huge decisions when uh, in in their companies is who to hire yes and also who to promote and develop yes and so how does uh, your approach help to make sure that the same things that we've always done mm -hmm. get changed in two very important decisions that companies make all the time. You know, we have a client right now. <clears throat> what we had to do is they have a national footprint. They're the sixth largest of their type in the world. Um, offices all over the place. And they have a sales force, for mm -hmm. instance, that is really should be, they go into neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. But because the sales department has a need for speed, they mm -hmm. want to find, we had to actually put something very intentional in their hiring process, Janice. Mm -hmm. And that was, for instance, and again, this is just the ethnic sliver of mm -hmm. DEI, yes. right? What they did now is that in order for them to do a new hire, you have to have ethnic diversity that is one in four. Mm -hmm. In other words, 25% of that pipeline, that pool from mm -hmm. which you draw, has to be ethnically diverse. Mm -hmm. Right now, they are ethnically diverse by human beings. And I'm saying, for instance, for this particular client, it's for communities of color to be represented, right? And so what that did is that it makes them pause because they know that they can't hire anybody until they have a candidate pool mm -hmm. that is representative of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And the gift that keeps on giving is the fact that as you meet these individuals mm -hmm. and you bring them into the organization, they actually represent new opportunities to engage more communities. So literally it feeds the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we really, uh, you know, when we put things like that because it also helps the pipeline. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. And that's what that's uh, and, and it continues. I mean, we can and you do it within your supply chain mm -hmm. because you begin to find out, OK, where's some of our underrepresented segments? We buy this directly. Mm -hmm. We buy this indirectly. What does our supplier network look like? Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> that just helps. But you have to be intentional about it. Yeah. And then you whatever you what do you pay attention to and you measure? Yes. You can see yes. improvement. Yes. Uh, so let's just say it's it takes uh uh, intention and yeah. committed, committed um, structures, committed standards of behavior. Yes. And so we all have implicit and yes. unconscious bias, and we have to have a willingness yes. to learn and adapt yes. um, and change. Um, but it also starts with some self-awareness. And so how do you address at companies that have Oh. I mean, they might have a heritage of 125 <laughs> years, or they might they, they might have people that have a length of service that have been there for oh over 35 goodness, years. Dad. That is so true, right? So what do we do? Okay, so that's really interesting. I, and I love that question because organizations that have that type of longevity, mm -hmm. their success can be their greatest enemy. Mm -hmm. Because, well, we've got 125 years. And sometimes I'm like, that's your problem <laughs> because you've been so assured mm -hmm. the world has changed in 125 years. Mm -hmm. Have you mm -hmm. has your way of thinking? Mm -hmm. If it hasn't, you're going to be a place that is going to literally see people exit by the droves. Mm -hmm. We know right now yeah. that 95% of the workforce in the U.S. is will is ready to quit. <sighs> yeah. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So if you don't give them a reason to stay. Mm -hmm. they're not going to. Mm -hmm. The other part about that, and as you said, everybody has some type of bias. I tell folks, just take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've got baggage, yes, right? Yes. The question is, is are you working on yours or not? Mm -hmm. That's really it. Mm -hmm. The third point I like to make is the best, your, the best an organization's culture can be mm -hmm. is the worst behavior that they're willing to tolerate. 
Uh, uh, say that again. The best your culture can be mm-hmm. is the worst behavior that you're willing to tolerate. Wow. So think about this. Mm-hmm. They give this person a pass. Well, that's just so-and-so. Mm-hmm. Guess what? He's a liability. Mm-hmm. And it's not okay that mm-hmm. he treats other people like that. Mm-hmm. It's not okay that he just flies off out the mouth. But he's been here for 45, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. He needs to know that that's not acceptable. And it's not even about being politically correct, Janice. Mm-hmm. It's just acknowledging and valuing another human being. Yes, yes. It's yes. not a party thing. Yeah. It's a human thing. Yes. But if they continue to allow that to go unchecked, mm-hmm. the ceiling mm-hmm. has been placed and yes. their limits have been put in place. Mm-hmm. Not by outside mm-hmm. threat, inside threat. Mm-hmm. Yes. And they and they just let it go. Mm-hmm. And so they have to make a decision is as do they want to continue to allow mm-hmm. him or her to have this what I call stinking thinking, yeah, this toxic attitude, or would they rather see their business thrive? And sometimes when the bus makes a stop, <laughs> some folks have to get off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Have you ever been in a situation where the core team members or some of that level of management just hasn't been on board oh yeah mm-hmm. yeah i mean you're always going to have even as we do it like these when they first say well we're thinking about working with gb and you've got some cynics in there like this mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i actually like cynics mm-hmm. because i know that if they have an open mind yeah they'll see that this is not the way and, and some of them are cynics jans mm-hmm. because they've been through de and i programs mm-hmm. and classes yes and so there's this baggage once we begin to talk about the business and supply mm-hmm. chain and innovation and, and return on mm-hmm. investment they're like okay wait a minute this is different mm-hmm. yeah it is mm-hmm. right yeah. so you're going to have folks that aren't with you um but i do think as i said once they see that you're going after it for the health of the business mm-hmm. and if we can create more engaged mm-hmm. more deeply engaged employees yeah. I mean, if you argue with that, then you've got a problem with the company. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so what, what would you say? Um, I loved you. We were speaking earlier about just the agricultural components of how this grows, yes. right? Yes. So sort of in that analogy, yes. tell us what that looks like. So I, one of the things I, I was saying is leadership is the climate, what thermostat is to temperature. Mm-hmm. And climate determines what grows. Mm-hmm. It also tells us that the best way to look at this is with a agricultural metaphor. Mm-hmm. It takes time. Mm-hmm. You got to plant the seed. You got to water it with mm-hmm. acts that mm-hmm. continue to reinforce your the mm-hmm. your commitment to this. Yes. Conversely, if an organization doesn't like what it's growing right now, mm-hmm. let's say their environment is toxic and people don't get along and teams are at each other's throat. Well. It's really simple. Mm -hmm. You'll never, ever grow an orange tree by planting an apple seed. Mm -hmm. So if you want a different harvest, you Mm got to plant a different seed. Yes. Right. And that is that metaphor. Mm -hmm. And it it takes time. Mm -hmm. You have to be committed to it, Mm -hmm. even when you don't feel like it, because we're not talking about the processes that we dial in. We're not saying it's all about celebration and and somersaults. (laughs) Some of this work is just flat out mundane, hard work. Yes but it pays off. Mm -hmm. So we just say, just trust the process and go with us on this because it's going to take time. Mm -hmm. It just does. Culture takes time to change. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's culture actually, as much as we'd like to say it's a statement on Mm -hmm. the wall. Mm -hmm. No, it actually Mm -hmm. lives in our head. Yeah. Yeah. It's thinking. Yes. Right. And so it's, it's how people think. And by the way, culture is simply the way we do things. Mm -hmm. Yes. And just because it's normal mm-hmm. doesn't mean it's healthy. Yeah, yeah. And maybe for our company that yeah. um, said, well, you know, we've we've done training with our employees and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, we feel like we've started on this journey, um, but it feels like it's fallen flat. And maybe because we're faced with so much of the whirlwind yes. of, of everything that's come at us, wh- where would you... St- what would you say to that company about what would next steps be? Generally, that's probably 80% of the organizations mm-hmm. we encounter. They're stuck in programs. Yes. And they're stuck in events. Mm-hmm. Not bad. It's incomplete. And the problem with it is that it takes a lot of energy to do events well. Mm-hmm. It burns people out. Mm-hmm. Right. And so 
if they're stuck there, and generally that's what it is, they they need to move, come off of the program track and get into the process track. Mm -hmm. Because the beauty of a process is once you set it up and you set the infrastructure up, you manage the process, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. A program, guess what? You got to do events every single week. Mm -hmm. You can put events within the process. Yes. And so when these organizations hit the hit hit that dead end, a lot of our clients, Jazz, we just come in and it's really about it's and it's not even about replacing what they've done. Yeah. We actually enhance what they do. Yes. But then we actually put it within a metric-based framework mm -hmm. and it gives it new life and a new lift. Mm -hmm. Because if they don't come out of programs, they're just going to continue to go around that same circle again. Mm -hmm. And the crazy thing about that is when the diversity champion leaves, mm -hmm. that initiative will implode mm -hmm. because it wasn't embedded into the organization. Yes. Yeah. It was on the shoulders of a person. Yes. And yeah. that's where mm -hmm. if they can change that, mm -hmm. they can actually get into a deeper. I think the rewards will come as a mm -hmm. result of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So le leaders are leading in the moment right now. Ugh. What what would your advice to be to them right now? Working themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because to your point, the capacity, I tell folks and leaders, I was just speaking to a large um, uh, education a school district and all their new hires. I said, the most... Uh, Sometimes the most difficult type of leadership is self-leadership. Mm -hmm. One thing. The other part of that is, is if you're not developing as a leader, mm -hmm. your capacity of your team is also greatly reduced. Mm -hmm. And in the field of cultural competency, diversity, equity, inclusion, you're going to have to watch some movies. You're going to have to read some books. You're going to have to have coffee with mm -hmm. people that are different from you. Mm -hmm. Don't get comfortable in rooms with people that, are, that look just like you because the goal is actually innovation happens in rooms where people aren't like you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and so this is just an amazing time for leaders or folks that kind of are okay with kind of accepting that kind of that name. Mm -hmm. It's time to get to work mm -hmm. and actually work on the inside. Yeah. Because if they do it on the inside, mm -hmm. the team yeah. can't help but to benefit yeah. the folks on the outside. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's where it starts, right? It just mm -hmm. does. We're and a reflection of our organizations, what we're working on. Yeah, it's that it's that that introspection yes. that is so important, mm -hmm. reflection. And you know, it's funny, I find a lot of leaders, even around the world, they don't give themselves time to breathe. Mm -hmm. They don't actually, they don't give what I call aesthetic time. Mm -hmm. That is time for your brain to breathe. Yes. They think that busyness equals output. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, is they don't want to take a vacation day. They don't want to go someplace quiet mm -hmm. and journal. Yeah. Those are some of the things that mm -hmm. keep you refreshed, keep mm -hmm. you refreshed. Yes. Because you can't even make big decisions when you're tired. Yeah. But a lot of folks, and I know particularly in, in, in some countries, of course, I know here it's like, you know, sometimes we wear that lack of taking vacation mm -hmm. as a badge of honor. I'm mm -hmm. like, no, mm -hmm. that's actually a badge of ineffectiveness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that's mm -hmm. where leadership mm -hmm. really has to, if we're serious about being the best mm -hmm. for our people, yeah. we also have to take care of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And now we're going to come back to you because I know our time is winding um, to a close. So I want to make sure that we get ch a chance for some of these other questions. So yes, thank you, Janet. Yes, yes. I, do, I do have a couple of questions actually. Um, sure. One of them is kind of a little bit of an expansion that they would like to hear about. Um, how can diversity help engage employees versus disengage employees? Well, I think diversity. I mean, the the power of diversity is that it really involves everybody. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no, there's no human being that cannot be engaged mm -hmm. in DEI because I think that persons actually, what it is is their perspective is probably in ensconced in simply ethnic diversity. Mm -hmm. Because if you actually look at diversity, mm -hmm. the point is is that everybody has a place at the, a seat yes. at the table. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why. Mm -hmm. That's why it can be. In, that's why mm -hmm. it's engaged. Is it generational? I mean, whatever facet of that, the point is, is everybody has a part to play, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And so, to me, that's that's really where that's how that 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 that's how that can benefit everyone. Thank you. Is there so another one, Anna? Yeah, there's. That's a great answer. Thank you. There is another one. Um, yeah. How do you overcome the organizational inertia based on efficiency and optimization? For example, ignoring the outliers. This is from Ari. 
Mm. <laughs> <laughs> my friend, my dear friend, you know, uh, the out, see, the thing is, there's such value in the outliers, mm -hmm. right? But if your focus is simply efficiency, what happens is when, when a business is focused just on efficiency and there's no margin for relationship, there is a lopsidedness that it'll develop because I always talk about the perfect blend of people and process, mm -hmm. right? If an organization is too much process, mm -hmm. guess what? The relationships are going to suffer. Yes. If it's too much people, it feels great, but there's no structure, no order. We can't go forward. Yeah. And I think oftentimes the whole idea of outliers is the fact that something new is being presented. Mm -hmm. But what's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. Bring outliers, outlying voices into the into mm -hmm. the into the middle of things. Mm -hmm. They actually that's a gift because they can help us think differently. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think outliers. There's such a value uh, for for having that seat at the table for folks that think differently. And again, when you're looking at innovation, you want that voice at the table. Gone are the days where we can simply, and I'm not saying exclusively, but gone are the days where organizations can just get sales together, mm -hmm. just finance together, mm -hmm. just HR together. Mm -hmm. We know there are times for those types of meetings. Yeah. But if you want optimal ideation, mm -hmm. you want sales with HR, with finance mm -hmm. in the same room mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. You may say, well, they don't have that background. That's the point. Mm -hmm. Yes put it in front of them to actually think about this in a new way. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where outliers just, it's such an amazing mm -hmm. gift. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for that question. <laughs> Great. I do have a really good one from Laura. She yeah. thinking of running an exclusion experiment at an mm -hmm. upcoming HR meeting to talk about inclusion. Have you okay. done this in the past and what good exercise to use or any thoughts that you have for her? Yeah, you know what? I think you got to be, you have to be really, really careful with exercises like that. Because if you don't have really in depth, in depth, and sometimes actually, some of my providers, by the way, are actually licensed therapists. Mm -hmm. You really need to know. I think there are other things that you could center on around ideation and the beauty and the opportunity of, of, of innovation and diversity as opposed mm -hmm. to exclusion. Because if people get, if people get what I'd say, kind of, if they start, you know, essentially bleeding on the floor because of that exclusionary exercise, who's going to sew them up? Mm -hmm. And so I'm really, I tell folks, unless you really know what you're doing, I would actually go on the opposite side and, and really focus on opportunities to create new ideas and say, that's why diversity is so important mm -hmm. because it helps us create things together. Right. And so that's, I would, I would, you know, you can do what you want at the end of the day. I've just seen it go wrong too many times. Great answer. I do have another one. Um, yeah. If somebody wants to take the lead um, and charge with the DEI efforts, who would that person be? The HR team, someone else? It all depends on the organization because, the, and we talked about this mm -hmm. prior to the session starting. I said, Whatever, wherever they come from, mm -hmm. they need real authority. Yes. That's the main thing. When, when I, and I've seen this so many times, the person essentially is on a specialist or coordinator level mm -hmm. in the organization. Not bad. Mm -hmm. But when you give them the, then they have that amount of authority, but you give them the title of chief diversity officer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is a, that's mm -hmm. actually a recipe for disaster mm -hmm. because they have the title, but they don't have the authority. Mm -hmm. The authority has to be commensurate with the title. Mm -hmm. So, in, uh, and so, yeah, we want them to be willing. Mm -hmm. We like that. We like a passionate person. That's great. Mm -hmm. But they're going to also, you have to understand they need structural authority to change things. Mm -hmm. They need access to the C-suite. Mm -hmm. They need to be at those meetings. They need to be able to really ask some of the tough questions and not get kind of, put on hold because it's too tough. So it, it really depends on really the focus is it's, it's not so much where they come from, but it's the authority that they're given. And what would you say to CEOs right now? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Thank you. If, if you're going to have a chief diversity officer, I'll have to give you an example. One of the gentlemen I had the pleasure of working with was Ted Childs from IBM. Ted Childs actually had authority over IBM. Mm -hmm. He had the title of chief diversity officer. Mm -hmm. Ted oversaw supply chain, 
policies and procedures, communication. He had he had insight and influence in everything. Mm -hmm. That is where um, I've seen it done really, really well. Mm -hmm. Don't give the title if you're not going to give the authority. Mm -hmm. I would say that to yeah. CEOs. Mm -hmm. And and if your ego mm -hmm. is too tender mm -hmm. to get asked the the, the, the hard questions. Mm -hmm. Um, you probably need someone else to, to lead and be a part of that journey. Mm -hmm. But I find that leaders that are really serious about growing their organization and growing themselves, yes. they don't mind having mm -hmm. the hard questions. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. And I think we might have time for maybe yeah. one or two more questions. Yeah, we can do one more. Um, okay. Sure. okay. <laughs> this is a question from Kelly. Um, it's it's a navigation question. When she has two people out of 400 in her company that want to abolish celebration of holidays, how do you deal with that? How do you navigate that, those two people? When you have two people out of 400, what that right. means is 398 don't want to. Mm -hmm. So I would actually go with the coalition of the willing. Okay. And um, because the, I, you, I, we have clients right now where they're publicly facing because they have a retail product. And I think sometimes they pay so much attention to the naysayers. Mm -hmm. I'm like, but what about the yaysayers? Mm -hmm. And that, in that regard, Anna, that's where I think uh, in terms of what Kelly's asking, I really, when 398 say yes and two say no, I would actually go with the 398. And the two that are naysayers, we have to, they have to ask themselves if they're willing to, what do I have a problem with? Mm -hmm. Again, go inside and find out like what why am I pushing against that? Because there's a reason that they are pushing. And it doesn't mean to dismiss their concern, but it doesn't mean to be educated about their concern. And it also means that they should be educated about mm -hmm. their concern. Mm -hmm. But I would just say that uh, it seems like the folks want to go forward, mm -hmm. continue, and don't make people feel small because they are an outlier. Mm -hmm. I believe in calling people in, not calling people out. Mm -hmm. So you pull them to the side very graciously mm -hmm. and say, hey, you know what? Could you kind of educate me? I, three power words, Janice. Help me understand. <laughs> yes. Help yes. me understand. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. I don't understand. And it's mm -hmm. very disarming and it's mm -hmm. gracious because yes. we don't know why they have what's going on? So I would just tell Kelly to, to do a deeper dive as to why they have the problem, but don't give them all your attention. Yes, I agree. And sometimes those naysayers can be the loudest too. So. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you, Anna. Appreciate it. And if there's other questions, um, we're happy to collect okay. them and and uh, continue to respond. Okay. All right. You know what I wanted to do? Yeah. We talked about yeah. this. Oh, do I, do I show them that? Or... Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. That's my fault. Yeah. This is great. Because what, one of the things, Janice, you and I talked about is that people are at different mm -hmm. places on this, yes. on this journey. Mm -hmm. And this is one. And in fact, from uh, you can see the quirkiness is actually <laughs> inspired from, from our friends at Zingerman's. Mm -hmm. And we did that on purpose because... We wanted, this is a book where someone actually, a client asked me, hey, Scott, we're going to launch this new initiative. Could you have a book? Could, is there a book that kind of shows, allows people to engage wherever they are? Mm -hmm. and I said, oh, yeah, I'll find it. And I couldn't find it. Uh, so I actually wrote it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. so over time, you know, mm -hmm. a, a publisher yeah. kind of said, this is, this is pretty good. So what this book does mm -hmm. is it just simply meets you where you are. Yes. It's fun. Mm -hmm. You can enjoy it as an individual, but it is really enjoyable with groups because mm -hmm. you can do, there are 101 opportunities mm -hmm. to engage and broaden that's your wonderful. landscape. So that's just, that's a good, uh, a good way to kind of keep, get engaged. They'll have the website on there, the link mm -hmm. for you, but uh, it's a fun way to broaden your landscape. Wonderful. Well, the good news is that uh, we're going to be going to be continuing these series yes. on diversity, equity, inclusion, and we uh, really want your feedback on what are some of the things that you're looking for? What do you want to receive? How can we customize these type of sessions so you get the most value uh, for what you're looking for? But any questions, um, certainly uh, my email is on the screen. Uh, just a reminder um, about the services that Express can offer as well. And we're also going to include um, Scott's contact information. Uh, we'll be sending a follow-up to you, um, which will have more information, um, anything that we can do to help and serve you uh, in this area we want to do. And uh, 
We also, um, I just want to let you know and encourage you about our leadership summit that's coming up. We're very excited. It is a virtual summit, but for all the month of September, every week over lunch, uh, you can meet an incredible leader. And uh, we're just so excited about it. Um, really starting off on September 8th, we have Yvette Salvatico, who is in a global change agent. I know when people hear the word change, they're like, oh no, but actually she's incredible and makes it fun and, and really has some great, again, strategies and structures yes. around how to be um, uh, really embrace change, yeah. which we're in an what hap it's happening every 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. So And without um, our permission. And without our permission, you got <laughs> it. And secondly, we have some great leaders from our international organization talking about teams. Um, on the third week of September, we're excited. We have um, Phil Reynolds joining us, which we spoke to. He actually is a specialist in self-leadership, which we talked about um, uh, throughout the session. And last, um, certainly but not least, on the last week, of September, we have Dr. Tim Elmore. And Dr. Tim Elmore is a really well-published um, expert, um, not only on the generations, but he's just come out with a new book um, where he studied leaders in history and really looked at sort of some of their yeah. unorthodox uh, wow. leadership styles, but how that relates to today. So again, um, we hope you can join us. Um, and just finally, just wanna thank you for spending an hour with us on your yeah. Friday. Um, it, it, we really value your time and, yes. and our whole goal is um, really to help make deposits um, that you can take and put tools in your toolbox and, and uh, we want uh, companies to be able to have what they need in order to uh, maneuver um, these mm -hmm. sometimes very uncertain times, but also to get stronger and better together. So thanks for joining us.